So we're going to start out with uh, our presentation, a presentation by uh, Sarah. Uh, Sarah uh, is originally from the Bay Area. She went to University of California, Davis. Uh, she's now a fourth year medical student at the University of South uh, Florida and currently applying virology. Um, she uh, said that her interest in palliative care began before medical school when she uh, volunteered at our local hospice program. And today she'll be lecturing on palliative care for the urologist. Good morning. My name is Sara Azari. I'm a visiting medical student from the University of South Florida. Thank you all very much for having me here. Higher? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me here this month and for having me here this morning to speak with you about palliative care for the urologist. So this morning we'll start with a brief overview of what palliative care is before moving on to palliative care and urology and some resources. First, a little bit of history. This is Dr. Balfour Mount, who is a Canadian urologist credited with coining the term palliative care and bringing the idea of palliative care to North America. He's called the, the father of palliative care in North America. And I think this just brings up the point that surgeons bring something very different to the table when it comes to having conversations about death and dying. And urologists especially are used to having difficult and sensitive conversations with their patients. So I think this is a topic that's very relevant for our field. So what is palliative care? The idea is that you focus on treating patients' symptoms instead of trying to cure them. And the goal is to relieve their suffering. This can occur in conjunction with curative treatment, which I think is a common misconception that it's either or. Um, and in this sense, palliative care and hospice are a little different. Hospice care is specifically for patients who are no longer receiving curative treatment, although they can decide at any point to go off of hospice and return to curative treatment. Hospice care is also intended for patients with a life expectancy of six months or less. Palliative care raises some pretty big questions about what we want out of our lives and ultimately out of our deaths. Um, and I think this is something that requires a lot of introspection on the part of both the physician and the patient. These are questions with no right answers. It's going to look different for everybody. One thing I wanted to bring up was the idea of timing um, in the early integration model. The traditional model of palliative care has curative care um, through the majority of disease with a palliative, switching to a palliative approach as death becomes near. And the early integration model has both from the beginning of diagnosis all the way through death with the proportion of palliative treatment increasing as the patient becomes sicker. And this really allows for maximal symptom control and quality of life benefits while still allowing the patient to receive whatever curative measures they still want. Looking at urology specifically, um, I'm starting with a retrospective review looking at over 7,000 patients with one basic bladder cancer. Out of these patients, only 4% saw palliative medicine subspecialists. So possibly some room for improvement here. Other studies have looked at the use of an integrated urology palliative care clinic. 85% of patients who participated in the clinic had an advanced directive. For a perspective, another study looking at a similar group of patients found that only 35% had an advanced directive at baseline. Of the patients who participated in the integrated clinic, 81% were using hospice services at the time of their death, and overall the patients reported no decline in their health-related quality of life even as their disease progressed. There are no AUA guidelines for how to use palliative care with urologic malignancies. I did find two reviews out of UC Davis um, that go over the major urologic cancers, the symptoms that tend to come up um, as patients to death approaches, and how to best manage those. So for example, with bladder cancer, patients often experience bleeding and pain. The workup can start with something non-invasive like screening for coagulopathy and go all the way down to radiation, hypogastric artery ligation, and even and this, for me, I think required a little bit of a shift in thinking. I had thought about these major surgeries like discectomy as something that was intended to cure cancer. Um, and I thought it was very interesting that for the right patient, cystectomy could actually be a palliative measure. That being said, it is important to make sure that you're choosing the right surgeries for the right patient. Um, this is a retrospective study out of UCSF looking at nursing home residents who had small urologic procedures like TERPs and supercubic tube placements, 
surprisingly, their one-year mortality was 50%, and they had a decline in functional status at one year out, which I think the study kind of goes to highlight two points, one being that the effects of our interventions can be different than we expect or bigger than we expect, um, and the other just being, again, the importance of having conversations with your patients about their goals and what they want and making sure that the cost-benefit analysis is appropriate for whatever decision you're making. Moving on to a few resources. I wanted to start with this conversation tool that was um, taught to us by one of the palliative care doctors at my home institution. It's called Wish, Worry, Wonder. And the idea is it allows you to align yourself with your patient while still acknowledging your concerns and making a suggestion for change. Um, and I think what I like about it, one, is that it's short. It's only three words. It's easy to remember. And two is that you can pick and choose. You could use each of those phrases individually or in conjunction with each other. So the example they give is, I wish we could slow down or stop the growth of your cancer. And I promise that I will continue to look for options that could work for you. But I worry that you and your, fa or you and your family won't be prepared if things don't go as we hope. I wonder if we can discuss a plan B today which sounds much better than, I don't think you're being realistic about your cancer outcomes and you need to look at other options. Although it's essentially saying the same thing. And this conversation tool, it's from the Serious Illness Care Program that was developed by Atul Gawande Zariadna Labs. They tested this in a four-year randomized controlled trial and found that it resulted in earlier conversations with better documentation of possible preventive issues. Another tool I wanted to share is called Five Wishes. This is a modified advanced directive that's legal in most of the United States, including Connecticut. Um, and it goes over the person I want to make care decisions for me, the kind of medical treatment I want, how comfortable I want to be, how I want people to treat me, and what I want my loved ones to know. It's a nice resource for patients in that it's simple and straightforward to fill out. This is what I personally have as my own advanced directive. Um, and I think in addition to serving the purpose of an advanced directive, it can also help open up conversations between families about needs of care. And this is something where there's a wide spectrum in terms of how comfortable people are. On one end, you have people like my mom, who I love dearly. Um, she is perfectly healthy and for the last decade has been bringing up her own end of life wishes regularly at the dinner table. So very, very comfortable on one end, um, ranging to people who absolutely never want to have these conversations. And I think for those people especially, it's nice to have a little bit of guidance when you're talking about medical Then looking at Yale, there's both an inpatient and outpatient palliative care service. Um, at other hospitals, I've heard that the, the outpatient palliative care service can sometimes be a little underutilized in terms of the services they have to offer. Here at Yale, um, it seems incredible. They help with medical care in terms of decision making at branch points, in addition to providing a variety of resources um, and referrals for social work, art therapy, home care, et cetera. And then if you're interested in the topic, um, some further resources, the ACS came out with a residence guide for surgical palliative care. And it starts with a few um, worksheets designed to sort of help you work through your own thoughts and feelings about end of life care before moving on to common symptoms at end of life, pain and discomfort, how to manage those. The other two books have been very popular in the last five years or so. I loved both of them. I think they're both very enjoyable to read and they bring something unique to the discourse about death and dying. Um, Dr. Togawande's Being Mortal is his sort of account of aging and dying in America and what our shortcomings are. And then When Breath Becomes Air is Dr. Paul, Paul Kalanithi's story of um, his own diagnosis with terminal lung cancer while he was completing his master's degree. The main takeaway points that I wanted to make today is really just the focus of palliative care being on reducing suffering and that this can occur simultaneously with curative care. For urologic patients specifically, it can help with end of life decisions and there are treatments available um, to manage the symptoms that come up at end of life with urologic disease. And then lastly, if you're interested, there are a lot of resources out there to help with further learning. I'd love for you to go from there. And thank you very much for your time and attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, the correlation between 
cost and outcomes um, in addition to our allocated palliative care resources, resources as we move forward? So costs are a big thing that come up in the conversation about palliative care, and I kind of waffled on whether or not to include it today. Um, I think it's fascinating. I think sometimes the message can be lost a little bit with palliative care um, in the sense that people have the misconception that it's a cost-saving measure when really the idea is for optimal treatment and optimization of quality of life. That being said, it does also serve as a cost-saving measure. 25% um, of Medicare spending right now is in the hospitalization costs, which I think most of us can agree is something where you're meant to be getting some treatment. Um, so I, I did find a couple papers that discuss palliative care as a way to both reduce costs while improving the quality of care. Um, and I think what, what they really focused on there too is the idea of providing the best care for the best cost and how those can't be working to reduce costs and quality. Does that sort of answer your question? Care expenditures that are big spot in the race centers like UCLA mm -hmm. through a lot of money at the patients that they're ending up with the Mayo Clinic and how they can <coughs> palliative care early mm -hmm. and um, they've saved a lot of money and the patient population is not going to be in the same place that palliative care is in the next ten years. So it should not be looked at as a That was, that was great. Thank you very much. I guess I sort of had two questions. One is, I mean, as you know from urology, I'm an oncologist, so I have a lot of sort of these conversations about how do we balance what we're doing for the management of your cancer versus your quality of life. Mm -hmm. So I guess, are there resources specifically for that? That's not truly palliative care, but it's sort of entry into a lot of that discussion. So do you know of any resources for that? And second, uh, secondly, is this something that we we kind of do as practice, should we be doing more, should we have integrated palliative care part of our curriculum or working closely with palliative care specialists? Like which model do you think would be kind of most appropriate? Um, this is a, I work at the VA too, and we have fantastic palliative care there. I mean, all of our patients are seen early. They're really brought into sort of the fold and, and, and managed aggressively in terms of palliative care which I think is a tremendous resource, and I'm happy to let these specialist people who really have the time to focus on the patients in that multidisciplinary kind of way take those patients, but I'm interested in your perspective as sort of your reading and thinking about that. Yeah. Um, so to address the first question in terms of discussing goals of care and, and quality of life and balance for sure, um, I think the Serious Illness Care Project does a really good job of helping with those conversations with patients. I also think that's an area where a palliative care consultation could be helpful um, for someone who has more time and training and experience with this to sit down and talk to the patient about how do we balance your goals, um, you know, how do we how do we get you what you want essentially, and that kind of leads into the second question. I think there's room for both. Um, I I don't think I personally am going to have the skills of a fellowship trained palliative care physician at the end of my training. Um, but that being said, I do think it's important to have some aspect of it integrated just so we know what to look for in that patient, so we know what sort of question to ask or what direction to go in. Are you, are you familiar with that evolution of the palliative care specialty? I mean, do you know much about that? Can you sort of tell us? Because I have some friends and uncle who like, Started, I mean, it seems like this just started like five to ten years ago with sort of it becoming a subspecialty. Do you know any more about I that? don't know. Okay. I'd love to hear what you have to say. It was growing. It's out there. There are people that are trained specifically to do this, just I think for all of us to know, and that uh, integrating with those people and finding out who they are, whether you're here or somewhere else, is probably an important option. One thing that's nice about it, too, is I've seen palliative care specialists in, you know, who initially trained in internal medicine and emergency medicine and surgery. It's something that people can go into from a wide variety of fields and sort of start their own outreach to the community. Thank you. 
you very much for your time. Morning, everybody. Um, I forget how much to do this. There we go. All right. Morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> for my grand rounds topic this morning, uh, I wanted to go over an area uh, in urology that there's some controversy and some evolution in the literature. Uh, in where, in terms of the management of positive margins after uh, partial nephrectomy. It was interesting to go over this topic just kind of to see how this has evolved over the course of the last 10, 15 years, our understanding of this in the literature. Um, this was working for me. So uh, just to give a quick introduction, um, RCC incidents have been rising for decades uh, with an, uh, about 64,000 cases a year in the United States. It's the sixth most common cancer in the United States. Uh, these tumors are increasingly being detected at a small size with the increasing utilization of cross-sectional imaging uh, throughout medicine, emergency rooms, uh, uh, and, and when these tumors are detected in appropriately small size, partial nephrectomy is our current standard of care. Uh, and that is based on a lot of data that shows that we have equivalent oncologic outcomes for partial nephrectomy and radical nephrectomy for appropriately selecting patients. There's an increased risk of, of developing chronic kidney disease when a patient has a radical nephrectomy. And chronic kidney disease induced by nephrectomy has been associated with increased cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. The goal of the excision in a partial nephrectomy is to have a rim of healthy tissue. The width of that margin does not seem to be related to outcomes. Positive margins have been shown in a lot of other malignancies to be associated with worse recurrence-free, disease-specific overall survival. However, this association has not been quite so definitively shown in uh, RCC specifically. To kind of give you my punchline before I go over all of my data, three take home points from my talk are one, the data is kind of limited by the retrospective nature of all of these studies and the fact that positive margins are a pretty unusual event. So it's a lot of retrospective small case series that we're basing our understanding on. Positive surgical margins seem to increase the risk of both local and distant disease relapse, which is actually something that's kind of evolved in the last several years in literature. Um, however, the data for impact on overall survival and cancer-specific survival are a bit more mixed. And in terms of actually managing these patients, when you do get back a positive margin after the surgery, more intensive surveillance seems to be the most appropriate management based on the data that we have currently. So what are our risk factors for developing, uh, for having positive margins in surgery? I wanted to look at anything about the surgical approach that might increase the risk of positive margin, anything about patient characteristics or any tumor characteristics that might make us more concerned for potentially having a positive margin in the case. Um, so in terms of surgical approach, this has been looked at pretty extensively in the literature. Uh, as we transition from open surgery to laparoscopic surgery, from laparoscopic surgery to robotic surgery, there were a lot of comparative series as those transitions were being made. And we, all of these series are kind of quoting in the one to 7% range and no definitive difference between these different approaches has been shown for appropriately selected patients. In terms of on versus off clamp partial nephrectomy, uh, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Kenny as well as the rest of the urologic literature, um, we have not been able to definitively show a difference in terms of positive margins for on versus off clamp partial nephrectomy. Patient characteristics, the most convincing one that I found in my literature review was imperative indications. So these patients with solitary kidneys, CKD, familial syndromes, uh, these patients are a bit more likely to have positive margins. And that's kind of intuitive. These are the patients that you're more likely to take on these more complex tumors uh, that you may otherwise, in the patient who has a normal contralateral kidney, be recommending a radical nephrectomy. In terms of tumor characteristics, um, centrally located tumors uh, have been shown to have an increased risk for uh, positive surgical margin. Again, some of these more complex partial nephrectomies that you might have. Uh, in terms of grade, the literature is not quite so clear. Some of the literature shows no association. Some of the literature shows that higher grade lesions have a higher risk of positive margin. Um, so the jury's kind of out on that one. And in terms of association with size, 
literature is kind of all over the place on size. So I found some papers that show that smaller tumors have a higher risk of positive margin. I found some papers that show that there's no association with size and positive margin, and other papers that show larger tumors have a risk, higher risk of positive margin. So we really don't have definitive data to predict one way or the other whether size is going to change your risk for positive margin. Uh, looking at this, at, at all of this literature in terms of risk factors for positive margins, kind of what I took away from it are that these patients with imperative indications and centrally located tumors are risk. So the more complex, technically challenging surgeries are ones that are higher risk for having a positive margin at the on final pathology, which is intuitive based on the, the procedure. What about the value of frozen sections during this procedure to help reduce your incidence of positive margin? So I looked at a couple of different papers uh, in terms of the utility of frozen section. This was one of the earlier ones that reported on a 300 patient case series, uh, three and a half centimeter tumors, uh, on median size. In this series, this was about a 15 year experience at a single center. They had two positive intraoperative frozen sections. Both of those patients had a radical nephrectomy in response to that frozen section, and neither patient had any tumor left in the radical nephrectomy specimen. They then had four additional positive margins that were not detected on frozen section. And one of those patients had a local recurrence detected on CT scan and underwent the nephrectomy later. The other three were followed for several years with no evidence of disease. So in this 300 patient series, frozen section was essentially useless. There were two positives that didn't have cancer and four negatives that did, or rather one negative that did have cancer. Um, another series looking at 29 patients that had interoperatively identified positive margin that was either via frozen section or by the surgeon examining the specimen after removal. Um, eight patients underwent an immediate nephrectomy. None of them had any remaining tumor. 21 patients had a re-resection. So kind of depending on the timing of, that the positive margin was noticed, that would include opening the renorophy, putting a clamp back on, which they, they didn't really have great data for that in the, in the series. Um, this is a retrospective series, as is all of this data. Um, of those 21 patients who had a re-resection, two of the patients had a repeat positive margin, radical nephrectomy, and did, in fact, have residual tumor. So overall, for these 29 positive margins that they had, they had a 7% rate of actually finding cancer. Um, mean change in GFR for this group was 25 for a patient who had a nephrectomy and 4 for a patient who had a re-resection. They did not compare re-resection against patients who just had primary resection of the tumor in this series. Last uh, paper for frozen sections. Um, this was a combination of both intraoperatively identified positive margins and postoperatively final pathology identified uh, positive margins. So patients with intraoperative frozen section uh, PSM, five of those patients had a nephrectomy, only one had residual tumor. Four of them had a re-resection, only one with residual tumor. So only two patients actually had tumor uh, of the nine with positive margin. And then seven patients had positive margin on final pathology, those seven patients all had negative frozen sections. Um, four of them had a delayed nephrectomy, so went back to the operating room as a separate, mate, uh, as a separate surgery for no cancer left. And three patients were followed clinically with no evidence of disease. So overall, the literature and the data for actually performing positive margins intraoperatively, not great. It doesn't seem to be super helpful in actually determining uh, patients that have residual cancer. Um, uh, and re-resection and especially radical nephrectomy seem to be over-treatment for the majority of patients, but not all. There are some patients that you actually do catch residual cancer. So we don't have great methods for kind of reducing the risk of positive margins other than performing a quality, well-done surgery. Um, what is the actual clinical significance of a positive margin? And this is something where the literature has kind of been evolving over the last 10, 15 years. Um, so I wanted to uh, start with the, one of the first papers that was, uh, that was a major publication for this topic specifically. So this is the combined experience of MSKCC and Mayo Clinic for about 20, you know, 30 years of, um, of Mayo Clinic and 20 years of MSKCC. Um, in this series with 1,400 partial nephrectomies, they had 77 positive margins. Patients were followed for a median of three and a half years. Um, in the overall cohort, not just the positive margin group, they had 39 local recurrences and 50 patients that had metastatic regression. Um, here, they did do frozen, in this series, they did do frozen sections and re-resections. Um, uh, they didn't really report on firming grade, um, and they defined positive margin as any extension of tumor to the ink surface. They didn't have a minimum uh, threshold. Looking at their data, um, just to highlight the, the important findings that they found here, they found that patients that had solitary kidneys were more likely to have positive margin. And this was one of the papers that showed that smaller tumors were more likely to have positive margin in this group. 
in terms of predictors, the, that, that's the top table. Bottom table is predictors of local disease recurrence for metastatic progression as a combined endpoint. Uh, patients with solitary kidney were more likely to have um, re uh, recurrence and progression. Um, again, larger here, larger tumors were more associated with disease recurrence or progression as expected based on what we know about the um, pathology of a larger renal tumor. Positive surgical margins were not associated with local recurrence or metastatic progression uh, in this series. And papillary subtype was protected against uh, disease recurrence for, for this series. And then here's their Kaplan-Meier curves that show that there was no difference in survival between the two groups, positive margins, negative margins. They suggested that maybe this is due to cautery in the resection bed with the argon laser versus clamping that kills these highly, metab uh, highly metabolically active cells. Um, but I think that's important to define in this paper as well as the next couple that I'm going to be going over, it wasn't really long follow-up. Th these patients were followed for a median of three and a half years. Um, only a third of patients were followed out for five years, 10% were followed out for 10 years um, in, the, in this series. And about three, three and a half years is the follow-up on several of the papers that I'm gonna be presenting. This next paper, a couple of years later, on European urology. Um, this was another 20 years of data, a multi-institutional retrospective series. They had 111 positive margins, uh, overwhelmingly open surgery. 40% of the patients had imperative indications. So again, familial syndrome, solitary kidney, CKD. Um, some patients did undergo repeat surgery after their uh, positive margin. Three patients had a partial nephrectomy, 15 patients had a radical nephrectomy, and of the patients that underwent a second major surgery, only 40% of them had residual tumor, which is higher than the numbers that I was quoting before, but the numbers I was quoting before were frozen sections. This is a positive margin on final pathology. Um, they did two analyses in this trial, um, I'm sorry, in this, in this uh, series. They did a, analysis, a comparison of positive margin patients against unmatched controls, and then they redid the comparison with a matched cohort that was the same number of patients. Those patients were matched for indication, size, stage, and grade. Um, and they had similar results between the two. So patients with a positive margin were more likely to have a centrally located tumor, and they were more likely to have recurrence on univariate analysis. Um, but at the bottom is, is their multivariate analysis, where positive margin, this is the multivariate analysis for prediction of recurrence, uh, where positive margin was not associated, but the centrally located tumors were, an imperative indication was associated with recurrence for these patients, but positive margin was not here. In this series, I, I think they were. I know for the last one, they definitely were. In this series, I believe they were. Yeah, and, as, and, as, and as, you know, as, as I'm thinking about this more, these were overwhelmingly, it was open surgery in, in this group. So I think that they were more, I, I think that they were sending frozen sections during, during this. But yeah, it was 26 sensors. So it was hard to. So I think one thing also to think about is what the diagnostic test of a positive margin is. And is it actually a good test, right? Because I mean, you can do a complicated partial nephrectomy and then take a couple specimens of the tumor bed um, and say, and call it final margin. And if those are negative, you'll have a negative surgical margin, right? And so um, even if you have a microscopic positive margin on the actual tumor specimen, 
you know, if you send the pathologist a couple bites of areas where it's obviously negative, you will get a negative surgical margin, right? So the system can be gamed. I don't think people actually would would do that, right? But um, uh, but I think it's easy to see how that uh, could be done in order to achieve a negative margin, right? That's one. The second. It's a two tiny little segment, and then you know, or two, three, four tiny segments, and then um, uh, a microscopic positive margin and a grossly positive margin. You know, if you look at like people talk about in the surgical oncologists talk about like an a, uh, an R zero, R one, or R two resection, right? The idea an R zero resection is microscopically negative margins, and R one resection is microscopically positive. R two is grossly positive. And a grossly positive margin in a partial nephrectomy means like you're leaving real tumor behind, right? A microscopic positive margin may be absolutely meaningless, right? If you, let's say you're enucleating a specimen and they don't see the false capsule in that area, they might call it a microscopic positive margin. The other thing to consider is they don't actually evaluate the entire inked margin, right? So they're not doing like a, necessarily like a whole mount kind of uh, processing of the specimen. So you have a really, really large surface area and they evaluate a very small portion of it. So um, what we call a negative margin may not really be a negative margin. What we call a positive margin may not really functionally be a positive margin. It's not the world's best test. And, and that's kind of how the data is borne out. When you have a positive margin in your final pathology, you actually do a resection, and more than half the patients, depending on the series, don't actually have any tumor left. Um, so, so far, we haven't, th this paper didn't report on, on uh, overall or cancer-specific survival is my last point. Um, this next series, a little bit more recent, uh, was specifically wanted to look at patients who had high-risk tumors. So we know that Furman grade one, Furman grade two lesions tend to be fairly indolent. So maybe that's why we haven't been seeing any effect on overall survival. So this paper was specifically trying to look at high-risk patients who have positive margins and whether or not that has any effect on, on the recurrence rate. Um, this, this paper excluded um, the imperative indication patients. So there were no solitary kidney familial syndromes in this series. Uh, they looked at 1,200 patients who had t clinical T1 or clinical T2 disease. They had 97 positive margins. About two-thirds were low-risk, one-third high-risk. Um, they didn't find any association with tumor size, grade, stage. Um, and they had 69 recurrences. And again, about three years follow-up in this series. Uh, I think an important note is that in this series, the median time to recurrence was 19 months. Uh, it was a little bit shorter for patients who have positive margins, 19 months versus 21 months for negative margins, um, which was statistically significant. When they looked at this series, they found for recurrence risk uh, that positive margin was associated with recurrence. Um, tumor size, so larger tumors associated with recurrence. Again, intuitive, higher grade tumors more likely to recur. T3 tumors more likely to recur, and papillary less likely to recur. And when they did their Kaplan-Meier curve, this was just stratifying by positive margin and negative margin, and they did find a significant difference between these two groups. But what I thought the most interesting result of this paper was this Kaplan-Meier curve, where they subdivided the patients into low versus high risk, low risk being Furman grade one or two and T1 disease. So any patient who had Furman grade three or four or T2 disease was considered high risk. And these patients had a very, uh, very different recurrence curve than the other patients, this being statistically significant. Um, so I think that these kind of high risk positive margin patients are potentially something as we go forward in the future, these are patients that we should maybe be looking at a little bit differently than all comers. But so far, we haven't actually had any data that shows any impact on survival. So we have some data that shows that, re that recurrence might be, a you might be a high risk of recurrence after a positive margin, but there's no data really on survival. This paper um, sought to address that uh, by looking, by doing a database level study. So this was 21,000 patients with 1,300 positive margins. So an order of magnitude more patients than all the other series that we've been talking about. And all these patients had minimum follow-up of five years. Um, here, they, and they did associate positive surgical margin with higher risk of all-cause mortality. Now, again, this is national database level review. 
obviously data is going to be pretty limited by the design of the study. Um, but in this, this paper was the first one to show a difference in survival for patients who have positive margin versus negative margin. So positive margins increase your risk for recurrence, might have an effect on survival. Our data is kind of limited. How do you respond to when you receive the pathology report a week later and find out that the patient did have a positive margin? Right now, our response is more intense surveillance, more CAT scans. Um, and I wanted to just quickly go over our uh, guidelines. Uh, this is the AUA guideline for uh, surveillance after uh, surgery for small renal mass. So the left side are your kind of low risk patients. These are your T1 patients. Um, and they are able to be imaged at a less common interval. However, in the AUA guidelines, having a positive margin, even if you were a low risk T1 tumor, precludes you from being in this left side and it places you into the right side, the moderate to high risk category. So it's more intensive surveillance, more, uh, more abdominal and chest imaging. The NCCN guidelines, overall, they're a little bit more rigorous than the AUA guidelines, include a, a, a bit more imaging. Um, and in the NCCN guidelines, they recommend a more rigorous imaging schedule or technique modalities can be considered if positive margins or adverse pathologic features, such as sarcomatoid grade three or four or positive margin. We do in fact see positive margins in both of these guidelines. Um, so, so far, based on the data that we have, looks like re-resection going back to the operating room seems to very often be over-treatment for these patients and our guidelines currently recommend more intensive surveillance for these patients. In terms of future directions, uh, I think that our data is kind of limited by the follow-up on a lot of the studies that we're kind of basing our understanding on. A lot of these studies have three-year follow-up, but we also know that from some of these studies, it takes about two years for recurrence to happen, and then for actual impact on survival is going to be another couple of years, especially now as we're moving into the more targeted therapies. So with three years follow-up, I think that part of it is that we're just not capturing uh, survival with the follow-up that we have in these trials so far. Also, again, we're limited by small numbers. And in a 90 patient series, it's going to be challenging to demonstrate effects on overall and cancer-specific survival. One thing I didn't find anywhere in the literature is the role for ablation, percutaneous uh, thermal ablation. Uh, it's not really talked about at all in the literature. Uh, I think, you know, when you're talking about repeat radical surgery with a so anywhere between a seven to 40% chance that they're actually being cancer there, that's a pretty hard sell for most patients. But if you're talking about one of these minimally invasive techniques like ablation and appropriately selected patients, I think that there's something that as a field we should be considering, but we don't have any data to actually support that kind of risk analysis currently. I think especially for these patients, these high risk positive margin patients, I think that these are patients who have almost a 50% chance of recurrence um, that we really should be considering some kind of therapy in response to this. But at the moment, we don't have any data to actually support the, any invasive interventions. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, over, of the overall cohort from their like 1,200 patients, yeah. I think that in this series, they had a combined um, endpoint. Yeah, they, they were just using recurrences, uh, and I think that was just based on number of patients. Yeah, I mean, this, this was just recurrence as a combined endpoint. Yes, this, this was uh, final pathology. And just to kind of go back to my final take home points, we've limited data to base our treatment recommendations on currently, um, but we do have data that does suggest that we have increased risk of local and distant recurrence after a positive margin. Uh, but right now, our best practice is to just recommend increased intensity of surveillance for these patients. We, we can't really support more invasive interventions at this time for these patients. These are my references, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions.
uh, in terms of enucleation, uh, I, I did come across that. I didn't really want to dig into it with the time for, for this presentation, but um, enucle you know, enucleations are being done. There was, there's some data that actually uh, showed a significantly improved positive, uh, rather improved negative margin rate for enu enucleation versus traditional, um, which didn't make a ton of sense to me in reading those papers. But in terms of current recommendations, I think that what, you know, what I've seen in practice, and I think probably what most people are doing is to send, uh, send frozen sections during open surgery, um, but frozen sections haven't been getting utilized as much in robotic and laparoscopic surgery. Um, I think that's probably a, a technical. Um, based on the data that we have, frozen section doesn't seem to be tremendously helpful often, but there isn't uh, you know, guideline statements that I came across in terms of use of frozen section. So, um, so I used to routinely get frozens on my open partials. Um, in general, my, my uh, based on a paper that Simon Kim published from the National Cancer Database, Data Bank showing like real world, there is a higher margin in lap and robotic partial nephrectomy compared to open. Um, so I tend in my practice to do the, the, the highly complex one or complex ones open low complexity or intermediate complexity, I tend to do minimally invasively with the hope of trying to improve my margin rates. Um, I used to, because I was doing complicated ones open, I used to send frozens routinely. I had a couple that were false positive um, and um, uh, went and like re-resected and stuff and all the re-resections are negative. It, I, I stopped doing it. What I do is I, I, have, I have them look at the specimen grossly if I'm concerned. Um, and if they have any concerns, I ask them to freeze it. But if it's grossly negative, I don't, I don't bother sending a frozen. I'm not, a, uh, you know, enucleation, I think for the right clinical situation makes a lot of sense. A BHL patient, multiple tumors, I think enucleation is the right thing to do. But um, I can't imagine that enucleation um, at, at the cortical margins, right? So in the cortex, I can't see why enucleation would actually lower a margin rate than taking a few millimeters of tissue. But many times in the sinus, you don't have a choice. Right, because it, you you cut down, you 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 get a nice cortical margin, and then the base of the tumor is in the fat and the sinus, and then you can just enucleate it, lift it out, and it should have a nice, it should have a cap, a false capsule around it. But oh no, the other option is to cut out a whole bunch of fat and blood vessels and collecting system and destroy kidney. Yeah, I was going to comment on sort of both of those. I mean, I don't send margins anymore. I never really did. I do enucleate now almost all tumors. I think the reason that you have a lower negative margin rate with the enucleation than with taking a margin is you can see where the edge of the prostate, where edge of the tumor is. Unless you have an irregular tumor, and even when you do have an irregular tumor, by enucleating it, you're following the contour of that tumor. Um, and you can see where it is rather than cutting, and you can very easily get out of the wrong plane and go straight across part of the tumor. And that is my rationale for why you probably have a higher margin rate in non-enucleation versus enucleation. The concern with enucleation is that you're leaving some microscopic cancer cells. Um, I mean, I don't remember the reference. I thought it was Yosepowicz's, but when you were presenting it, I'm, it seemed a little bit different. But a gross positive margin is associated with recurrence. If you don't have a gross positive margin, even if it's microscopically positive, there's no higher recurrence rate long term. Would think about five years of follow up. So that's why I'm not sure if it's that reference. Um, there's no recurrence rates any higher with a microscopic positive margin versus a negative margin. Um, and granted, those aren't the long term follow up. We now have that other study. Um, but on, and in terms of the margin, Dr. Singh was type was, was sort of bringing up the point: is there an appropriate margin that you need? So I would argue that. If you're enucleating, you have no margin, and that's adequate. Um, Dr. Resnick apparently said if there's any tissue that's negative, that's enough. You don't need a five millimeter margin. You don't need a one centimeter margin. It's sort of if there's any negative tissue. And I would say we've kind of gone even farther than that with the enucleation, where as long as you don't have any gross cancer left behind, it does not appear to be an increased risk of, uh, of recurrence. Um, but I. Absolutely. I, I, I agree 100%. I mean, I, I do all complex partials um, open anytime where I think that it's going to be more challenging. I mean, I, I have no problem doing the cases robotically. I think 
uh, you know, I'm not doing as many of those as maybe some other people like at US, UCLA or USC who do everything robotic. But I agree, I think that you're getting a higher positive margin rate in some of those, even if you're doing a selective clamping and, and you're, it's just really hard to see in some of those complex Tyler cases. I, I was just going to present a case that Dr. Hess and I did uh, last year uh, based on the PATH report and then just kind of get a sense of the audience of what they, what they would do. Um, so this is a 56-year-old woman, otherwise healthy. She had a, uh, had a partial nephrectomy of a three-centimeter mass. And the PATH report reads, clear cell type uh, two of four, uh, exophytic, uh, lower pole, um, just, you know, pretty, pretty, exo mostly exophytic. Uh, we took a, ro a room of normal tissue. And um, it's negative surgical margins, and then it's read as focal invasion into perinephric adipose tissue. And it's reviewed by Dr. Humphrey, and it's read as PT3A. What, what people think they would do? Sure. Yeah, so what I what I tell patients if I'm doing a partial nephrectomy is that most that clinically they're stage T1 or T2 or whatever, but that there's always the I always counsel people that there's a possibility of upstaging, and that uh, there's published there's several publications uh, with people who have pathologic T3A disease, um, and uh, with following uh, following those patients with pathologic T3A um, who actually have reasonable um, um, oncologic outcomes. But I don't use that to justify a partial nephrectomy in someone who I think clinically has T3A disease. So if someone clinically has T3A disease, I favor a radical nephrectomy because obviously they're, they're different animals. T3A in terms of uh, renal vein invasion or T3A or, or, fat, or fat invasion. So if you think visibly there's peri, perirenal or, or hyalur fat invasion, you would counsel them for a radical? Uh, yeah, if they have a, if in, in the elective setting, yeah. 